You can only have two things in life, reasons or results. Notice, reasons don't count. Folks will always point out reasons on why they are not living their dream, on why they are not manifesting their greatness. They will always be able to point those things out, but none of those things count. The only thing that counts are results. And results don't lie, ladies and gentlemen. Results. Every once in a while, you got to take a measure, see how you're doing. What is the result at the end of the day, the result at the end of the week? You can't let too much time go by without checking. They tell it all. Judge a tree by the fruit that it bears, not the ones that it might talk about, not the ones that it might wish for or think about but the fruit that it actually bears. Six years I'd been out there working when I met my teacher, Mr. Schultz. Schultz said, well, Mr. Rohn, let's just go through a little summary here. He said, in the last six years, how much money have you saved in investment? I said, what? Zero. He said, you have messed up. He said, who sold you on that plan? I thought, my gosh, the man's right. I'm a nice guy. I bought the wrong plan. Right? Didn't need to change country. Bought the wrong plan. What a sad scenario that would be. He said, how many books have you read in the last 90 days? I said, what? Zero. Wisdom of the world available? Change your life, change your future? Wisdom of the world available? Develop, develop any skill you want? Earn the kind of income you want? Haven't read any books in the last 90 days. My teacher said, Mr. Rohn, you have messed up. I'm telling you, you've got the deal. You don't need to unmess the country. You don't need to straighten out the perplexed. You don't need to straighten out any of this stuff. All you've got to do is look within and let results teach you a great deal about your own activity, your own attitude, and your own philosophy. I went through that process. Take this phrase home. Results is the name of the game. What other game is there? So let us look. I think that all of us are, are committed. But I think that some of us are producing results in our lives that that level of commitment brings that we particularly don't like or find distasteful. I don't think that as a participant in life, you cannot be committed. You're either committed to mediocrity or you're committed to greatness. You're either committed to being productive or you're committed to being non-productive. You're committed to being happy or you're committed to being unhappy. See, whatever you're doing, however you spend your time, that tells you who you are. So think about what it is you like to create in your life experience. Once I look at how you commit your time, I can tell you exactly what you're committed to. People that say they have dreams or want to open a business or want to do something differently than what they're now doing, they don't like their jobs, they're unhappy, they're unfulfilled. People who say they want to improve their income level, look at how they spend their time. How they spend their time, the commitment of their time, how they use that, that will really tell the truth. People who said, I'd like to do better, but you don't find them in vocational or technical schools, upgrading their skills and their knowledge, how they spend their time, that will tell you what's going on. People who say they want to normalize their weight, they want to be healthy, but every time you see them, they're eating, that will tell you that they're committed to being obese for the rest of their lives. People tell you they want to stop smoking and they're lighting up at that time. Folks that say, I want to stop drinking, and every time you're in their face, they're reeking with alcohol, that will tell you what's going on. Don't have to listen to what they say, just watch what they do. Commitment shows up in your life in what you do. And you think greatness goes on sale, but true quality never goes on sale. It's wrong for you to think that you're going to give an offering and God's going to bless a business you ain't committed to. Bless a marriage you ain't committed to. Bless you in school and you won't study. Who do you think God is? Somebody playing in Vegas? God is not hitting a slot machine. You can't get out of something, something that you're not willing to put into it. You have to put your everything, your everything, your mind, your energy, your effort, your discipline, your tenacity. Nothing is going to jump out the fire if you don't throw something in there. It's not going to happen. You better be committed or you ain't going to make it. On the other hand, you can make the commitment to your life that you don't like the results that you have. 
and that you're going to do something about it. See, that power is available to all of us. People who look at life and decide, I want something different for myself. Why is it that people are frightened by commitment? Because when you say the word commitment, that intimidates a lot of people. Why? Because it means you have to deliver. See, most people, you ask them, hey, look here, I'd like for you to do this. They'll say, I'll try. I'll try means that is my escape clause. When I don't come through, it's really a polite no. I don't have the courage to tell you no, so I'll tell you I'll try. Hey, look here, I need you to come to this meeting. I'll try. I say, what do you mean? You're going to lean toward the meeting? Try and sit down. You either do or you don't. Try and take this pencil out of my hand. You either do or you don't. There's no such thing as try. So most people like to use that language. They don't want to commit themselves because commitment means, among many things, no excuse is acceptable. That's what it means. No excuse that if you decided that you're going to do this, if it becomes hard, then do it hard. If it's difficult, so what? Here's all life asks us to do. Make measurable progress in reasonable time. Just take home that little phrase, good phrase. We're asked in life simply to make measurable progress in reason. Let me tell you what happens when you don't keep your commitment. Number one, it begins to deplete your, your self-esteem and it erodes your self-image. It weakens your faith in yourself. You don't feel good when you don't keep your commitments. The other thing is that you begin to develop weak relationships with people. People begin to realize they can't depend upon you. They can't rely on you because you won't keep your word. You've established that kind of reputation. Just think, what would your life be like if you decided to keep your commitments? What will all of our lives be like if we decided to keep our commitments? That we decided to do the things that we said that we were going to do. Make it a seven day commitment that I won't say I will do anything unless I'm going to do it. And find out what your life will be like. Let me tell you what, if you follow it through, if you keep your commitment to the commitment, at the end of the seven days, you'll feel strong and powerful. Because by honoring your commitment, each time that you do, that empowers you. Whatever discipline that is required. Whatever it is that you must do. My most precious gift in my life, next to my wife and my kids, is my library. So I spend at least $200 US every month on books. Someone said to me one time, how can you afford to spend that a lot of mo that amount of money on, on books? I said to him, if you, if you think knowledge is expensive, try ignorance. Then I told them, I can't afford not to buy the books. Whatever you invest in, you become good at. Whatever you invest in, you become good at. You need to invest in your development. Some of you invest in clothes, and I, I like good clothes too. But you pay 200 pounds for a shoe, 300 pounds, 400 pounds for a suit, and then nothing on books. And you have to invest in your development. So I'm suggesting, number one, commit yourself to live in the present. Many of us, are not able to move forward and develop and manifest our greatness because we spend so much time looking back or worrying about the future. See, you cannot go into the future and manifest your greatness when you have various things in your life that's blocking you. Remembering what Dr. Robert Anthony said about results. When you keep your commitments, you're able to produce some different kinds of results in your life. So how can we keep our commitments? And do we keep all commitments? No, we don't. You will not be at 100%. However, you will have a greater percentage rate of, of maintaining your commitments to yourself, whatever those things might be. If it's going into business, if it's, if it's changing a habit that you know that works against you, if it's overcoming self-destructive behavior, if it's retraining your thinking, if it's reinventing yourself, if it's trying to begin to design your relationship differently, all of us have the possibility by focusing and really harnessing our attention and concentrating on it, we really have available to us the power to honor our commitments in those particular areas. So number one, make it priority. 
See, no one would go get on an airplane if you thought your chances of getting there to your destination were as good as your lunch. Am I correct? See, and I say the reason that you will reach your destination more times than your luggage will is because the airline, and I'm glad that they do, has made it a priority to move the human beings from one point to the other safely. So I'm not really upset when my luggage doesn't show up. I'm glad they delivered me. So if you want to honor your commitment, whatever you decide that you're going to do, make sure you make it important. Make sure it is priority. Keep it before you. The other thing is, whatever that you want to do, whatever you want to begin to create and beginning to manifest your greatness and, and strengthening your level of commitment, and it's, it's really exercising your will, find something that you want to do on your goal, one action step, but make sure it stretches you, that it challenges you, but it's doable, that you can do it. This year I decided that I was going to exercise. So I started out doing just 10 setups and 10 push-ups. I know I can do that and not get upset about it. I can do that without thinking. So I started out small, now I'm up to 50, but if I try to do 50 starting out, I wouldn't still be doing it. That strengthens your will, so my commitment now is strengthened and fortified by the activity of actually doing it. So now I can expand and build from there. When I decided to begin to manage my money differently, and I started saving 5% of my money, then I increased it to 10%, then to 15%. So now I have disciplined myself to live off 75% of my income. I took discipline to do that, but I started watching how I was spending my money. I started keeping a law and following myself. So you want to begin to find something that is manageable, that you know that you can do. Through all the things I've gone through in my life, I had a lot of, a lot of downs. How did I keep the faith? There was a couple of reasons. Number one, I know from living that if you quit, whatever you're trying to accomplish, if you quit, whatever you were trying to accomplish can never happen. There's not even a remote possibility. If you quit, there is no chance of it popping back up again, coming back later. Quitting is guaranteed failure. Now, when you're trying, you're going to fail. But quitting, just stopping, that was the number one thing I understood. And then number two, you have to make sure that your dreams, your aspirations and goals are so big that not accomplishing them is not an option. It's just not an option. You have to want something so big that it wakes you up in the middle of the night. You have to want something so big that you think about it all the time. You have to want something so big that it drives you to wake up when you don't want to. It keeps you up at night when you long been sleepy. It makes you show up, do things you wouldn't normally do. It requires extra. If you want to be extraordinary and not ordinary, if you want to be ordinary, live your life. But if you want to be extraordinary, you have to be extra. If you put extra on top of ordinary, that word is extraordinary. It requires an extra effort. If Now, if you don't want to do the extra effort, you finna be regular. There's nothing wrong with being regular. A lot of people are happy being regular. I just wasn't. I ain't want to be regular. I ain't want no regular life. I didn't want no regular house. I didn't want no regular car. I didn't want no regular clothes. I didn't want no regular checking account. I just didn't want it. I wanted to have an exceptional home. I wanted to have an exceptional bank account. I wanted to 
travel exceptional places. Now, if you don't want that, it's perfectly fine. You can be really happy being ordinary. But if something's burning in you, you got to deal with it. If you don't deal with it, you're going to be disappointed, man. So being regular is cool. It's nothing wrong with it. You get a regular job, regular house, regular car. You get regular money. You have regular hours. You can dress regular. You just go to the family room, you take your ass back home. You just travel regular. You go on vacation once a year. It's cool. Okay. You could get to get you a coach ticket, re- economy ticket, regular. You want to fly first class? You want to sit in the front of the plane? Okay. See, let me tell you something. You know what you ought to do? Save your money and buy a first class ticket. This is how you train yourself to be successful. Save your money. Get an upgrade. Buy a first class ticket. Because when you sit in first class, you're going to understand something. The seats are wider. You get a choice of meals. Chicken, beef, or fish. You get a bowl of warm nuts. They give you a hot towel to wipe your hands. Why do you think when the plane take off, they close the curtain? to first class because they can't let these regular people they cannot let you see what the f- is going on up there because you're going to want it back there but you didn't pay to get it hey what are they doing they're serving warm nuts where's our nuts wait a minute they didn't get charged for the food their food was free they didn't pay for the headsets they're watching all the movies why don't we have that? Because you didn't pay for that. So they closed the curtain so they don't have to deal with your regular ass. Wondering what's going on in first class. Once you buy a first class ticket, it becomes very difficult now for you to walk past those seats. Because now you're going to know what's going on. So when you treat yourself first class, You are conditioning your mind to now behave and do the things that produce first class results. So if you ever sit in first class, you'll never, you'll coach. Coaches, little tight ass chairs, you in the middle seat, you back there by the bathroom, the chair don't recline. It's horrible. First class, big seats. That's why Dick Gregory said, whenever you can treat yourself first class, you should, because it conditions the mind. Once you fly first class, you never go back. Once you get a private jet, you don't even want to fly first class, no more, because you're on a private jet. You ain't got to take your shoes off at the airport, they ain't going to open your bag. Your car, pull around, they open the door, you walk up the steps. They take you right to where you're going, then it's another car, when you walk down the steps, you don't even go baggage claim they put your bag straight off the plane in the car you don't go do none of that you fly private you'll never want to fly first class again because you get conditioned all you got to do is you can condition yourself once you buy a really nice dress you don't want a cheap dress no more you want another nice dress once you buy some christian louboutins with the red bottoms you want all your shoes to have red bottoms on them Because, you know, men like that red on the bottom of that shoe. I don't know what it is, but when you're walking away and we see that red bottom, I'm telling you, man, being successful is a mental condition. You can all mentally condition yourself to being successful. All you got is your mind. You in control of it. Now there's two ways to face the future. One, with apprehension. Number two, with anticipation. Guess how most people face the future? With apprehension. Why? Major reason why. They don't have it well designed. 
they've left the design of their future to somebody else. And if you don't make plans of your own, guess what? You'll probably fall into someone else's plans. Guess what someone else may have planned for you? Not much. You got to make a list of this not much stuff. I'm telling you, people all their lives count on this not much list. If all of your negative relatives all turn positive, what will that do for your future? Not much. If prices come down a little, what will that do for your future? Not much. If the economy gets a little better, what will that do for your future? Not much. If circumstances get a little better, what will that do? Not much. If the weather gets a little better over the next few years, that'll do. Not much. I mean, you could go right down this whole scenario list. Most people all their lives with their fingers crossed count on this not much list. That's why 10 years from now, they'll be driving what they don't want to drive, living where they don't want to live, wearing what they don't want to wear, doing what they don't want to do, having what they don't want to have, maybe become what they didn't want to become. And it all starts by counting on something that's not going to count much. You say, well, then how can my life dramatically change? You got to count on yourself. And here's one of the things you got to count on your ability to design the future. It's called the promise. And the promise of the future, if you'll design it well, can have an awesome effect on your life. But if you face the future with apprehension, you'll take hesitant steps all day, uncertain steps all day. And if you take uncertain steps all day for six years, you can imagine how empty your life can be. We've got to help our kids with the promise of the future. Now, here's what's connected to the promise, the price the price to pay. But I'm telling you, the price is easy if the promise is clear. One of the better notes to make for today. The price is easy if the promise is clear and powerful. But the price seems almost too much to pay, too much to get over, too much to accomplish if the promise isn't clear, if the promise isn't powerful. I'm telling you, kids will pay the disciplines if they can see the promise. One of our biggest challenges as parents in the 90s is to help our kids see the promise of the future. That's why I'm teaching financial independence, how to become wealthy and powerful and sophisticated and healthy and unique. All of the stuff kids would hope to go for. It's all possible. This is America. That's the promise of the future. The price, a few simple disciplines practiced every day. And I'm telling you, the kids will pay the price of the simple disciplines if they can see the promise of the future. But if they can't see, they don't want to pay. And the same is true of all. We will pay the most extraordinary just we can see the promise of the future called setting goals. So I'm asking you to get a handle on the future. I'm asking you not to leave it to anyone else. Not don't leave it to the company. The company's got their own goals. I'm asking you to set your own goals, your personal goals, income goals and financial goals and health goals and spiritual goals. And where do you want to go and what do you want to do and what do you want to see and what do you want to be? That's it. Promise of the future. Design your own future within your hands, your capacity. Here's how simple now goal setting. It's not mysterious. You don't have to anchor. You don't have to focus. You don't have to visualize. No, that's it. Here's how simple goal setting is. Change my life. Decide what you want and write it down. I mean, that's how profound this stuff is. Decide what you want and write it down. Make a list. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? What do you want to see? What do you want to be? What do you want to have? What do you want to share? What projects would you like to support? What would you like to be known for? What skills would you like to learn? Some extraordinary things you'd like to do? Ordinary things you'd like to do? Right? Silly little things you'd like to do, very important things you'd like to do. Decide, decide on all that stuff and write it down, write it down, write it down. That's how simple this stuff is. And it's your own private list. If it's really private, you know, on your list, put some stuff in code where nobody can understand it if this list <laughs> fell into unfriendly hands. And simple things, whatever. Foolish things, doesn't matter. It's your list. I had a little revenge on my first list. Budget finance, who used to harass me. I got two or three payments behind this one guy called incessantly. 
said, we're going to come get your car, drag it rear end up down the street in front of your neighbors. Put me down something fierce. When I met Shof, got my life straightened out, one of the first things on one of my lists was budget finance. And when I finally got the money, I needed a little drama in my life. Finally got the money to pay them off. I put it in small bills in a big briefcase. <laughs> Walked into the budget finance office on Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles. The guy who harassed me so often, his desk was about three back. I opened the door, walked in right up to his desk, stood right in front of him, never said a word. He said, well, what are you doing here? Didn't say a word. I opened up this briefcase, dumped this pile of money all over his desk. I said, count it. It's all there. I'll never be back. Turned around, walked out, slammed the door. Now that might not be noble, but you got to try it at least one time. Pay off with a little drama. Got to check them off my list. Keep your list with you. I keep my list in my journal so that I can go back. Five years ago, here was my list. And I'm a little embarrassed. Here's what I thought was so important now. How my philosophy has changed from 10 years ago, five years ago, three years ago. Here's my old list. Here's my new list. Here's what's valuable to me now. Here's what I want my life to be now. Here's where I want to go, what I want to do, what I want to see. Keep your lists of goals so that it shows your growth, shows your ability to change and grow. Your philosophy grows and expands what's valuable. Setting goals. It doesn't matter how small foolish it is. Put it on your list. My Japanese friend, Toro Ikeda, put on his first list, a Caucasian gardener. Good morning. Thought that was good. I like that. Have you got this profound thing now on setting goals? Here's how profound it is. Decide what you want. Write it down. Get together with your wife. Decide. Get together with your kids. Decide. Get together with your business colleagues. Decide. Write it down. Make a list. Okay, that's how easy it is. Now, let me give you one more scenario on setting goals. When I started making my first list, Mr. Shove said, Mr. Rohn, looks like we're going to be together for a while. I said, I've got a suggestion for you. He said, I think one of the first goals you ought to set, you're 25 year old American male. Sure, you've made some mistakes, but now you're on the road to better things. You've got a family worth it. Reasons makes the difference. And he said, you've got every reason to do this. He said, why don't you, among all the goals you're going to set, said, why don't you set a goal to become a millionaire? A millionaire. This is America. All the possibilities are available. Why don't you set a goal to become a millionaire? He said, it's got a nice ring to it. No. Enough zeros to impress your accountant. And he said, here's why. Now I thought, the man doesn't need to teach me why. I'm thinking, wouldn't it be great to have a million dollars? He said, no, that's not it. Here's why. And I had one of the greatest lessons I ever learned, and I'm about to share it with you. This will be worth the price of being here today if you can capture what I'm about to share with you. Babysitter fees, whatever else you pay. Some of you missed some sales today to be here, so this is a costly day for you. But what I'm about to share with you changed my whole life. Here's what Mr. Shove said. Set a goal to become a millionaire. And he said, here's why. For what it will make of you to achieve it. And I got one of the greatest classes in one sentence I've ever received in my life. Set a goal that'll make you stretch that far. For what it will make of you to achieve it. What a brand new reason for setting goals. What an all encompassing challenge to have a better vision of the future. What for? To see what it will make of you to achieve it. And here's why. The greatest value in life is not what you get. The greatest value in life is what you become. 
major question to ask on the job is not, what am I getting here? That's not the major question. The major question to ask is, what am I becoming here? It's not what you get that makes you valuable, it's what you become that makes you valuable. So Shelf said, set a goal to become a millionaire for what it will make of you to achieve it. Then he said, when you finally have become a millionaire, now he said, what's important is not the money. I thought, wow, I've got some more to learn. He said, no, no, Mr. And I'm telling you honestly, you could just give the money away. Now I did better than that, right? I told you, I lost it all. I'm rich by the time I'm 31, I'm a millionaire. I'm broke by the time I'm 33. So I didn't have to give it all away. I lost it all. Foolish mistakes I made. That I'm a farm boy from Idaho. That early money drove me bonkers. I used to say, how many colors does it come in? I'll buy them all. I just went, I went crazy over that first money. I just went crazy. And then I made that one foolish mistake, right? Continuing guarantee. I mean, you know, I'm so naive off the farm. I don't know what continuing means. And a few other mistakes. And by the time I'm 33, I'm broke. Now I've made and lost millions since then. But what an experience that was. And I'm telling you, the man was right. When I finally was broke at age 33, guess what I discovered? My money did not mean that much. It represented only a fraction of all my assets. Shelf said, once you become a millionaire, Mr. Rohn, you can give all the money away. Because he says, what's important is not the money. What's important is the person you become. Now, give me the, let me give you the key phrase on setting goals. Set the kind of goals that will make something of you to achieve them. Set the kind of goals that will make something of you to achieve them. Always keep that in mind. What will this make of me? If I set this goal and go for it, not only will I achieve it, but what will it make of me in the process? What a whole new concept on setting goals. Now there's two parts to this, and then we're wrapping up goals. Here's the first part now in this goal setting for what you become. Number one, don't set your goals too low. Interesting, we teach in leadership. You'll find it on the cassettes. Don't join an easy crowd. You won't grow. Go where the expectations are high. Go where the demands are high. Go where the pressure's on to perform, to grow, to change, to develop, to read, to study, to develop skills. I belong to a small group. We do business around the world. You cannot believe the expectations at that level. what we expect of each other in terms of excellence, far beyond average. Why? So that we can each grow, so that we can receive from the group, we can contribute to the group, something unprecedented. It's called living at the summit. Go where the demands are high, go where the expectations are strong, so that it'll provoke you, push you urgently, insist that you not remain the same for the next couple of years, the next five years that you'll grow and change. So don't set your goals too low. Charisma is derived from a Greek word meaning an ability to elicit favor in other people. It's a magnetic quality of personality that people respond to as if it were magic. Now, when you get good at that, you can reduce the amount of time that you stay there to next to nothing. But it starts with recognizing that there is an impermanence to pain, and it's critical to focus on that. It's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. How are you going to separate yourself from everybody else? You keep going, and then after that, you keep going. It's not always making the last shot. He's under pressure doing what you're supposed to do. And coming out successful, Kobe and Jordan were my heroes. Every single match, I didn't care who I was playing, they're in trouble before they even lace. And up, they always see us doing the easy part. Hold the trophy and kiss it. And that's what everybody sees they don't see the day where you do not feel like going to the gym at all.
Charisma is almost like a magic wand that confers power over others. But character has a very different origin. Character comes from a Greek word meaning chisel, or the mark left by a chisel. And of course a chisel is a sharp steel tool used for making a sculpture out of a hard or difficult material like granite or marble. And a chisel is also used for stripping away waste material from an object, stripping away stuff that might get in the way in order to get down to the essential thing, the thing that really matters. You've got to chisel your character out of the raw material of yourself, just like a sculptor. And then the last thing I remind myself is, I can always get better. I will learn from this and move on. Sometimes I worry, if I self-soothe, I might overstep and become too complacent with my mistakes and don't actually learn from them for numbing that pain or discomfort that could lead me to grow. How do you self-soothe without comforting yourself to the point of losing your drive? What a brilliant question. This is so smart. All right, this is what I call the advanced class. We are now in the advanced class. This is some nuanced shit. You've gotta be able to hold two competing ideas in your head, right? So critical life lesson number one was realizing this too shall pass and that the, there is joy in that impermanence. Has to create a statue. The raw material is always there. Everything that happens to you, good or bad, is an opportunity for building your character. Let me point out another important distinction between character and charisma. You may have noticed it already. In both its definition and its derivation, character doesn't refer to other people. It doesn't refer to having power over other people or getting other people to follow you or gaining favor with other people. Character is something that you have and that you are. You could be marooned on a desert island and your character would still be important. In fact, it would likely be very important in that situation. But charisma wouldn't do you any good at all. Charisma requires the presence of others while character is all about you. Then critical lesson number two is that I'm holding two competing ideas in my head and that is critically important. Important idea number one, it's good to feel the pain. I need that because that's gonna give me the motivation that I need as you so aptly point out to actually do something about it, okay? Part of the reason that mistakes, failure, is the most information rich data stream you will ever encounter is because when you fail, you feel pain and pain triggers areas of the brain around memory and focus. So now I'm really looking at this thing and I'm committing it to memory. Now, as long as I'm not pointing all my fingers at other people, all these people, this, the world, society, whatever, culture is victimizing me. Okay, if I don't do that and instead two thumbs pointed right back at this guy, then I'm reminded, oh yeah, I'm in control. You see, when you're not pursuing your goal, you are literally committing spiritual suicide. When you have some goal out here that you're stretching for and reaching for that takes you out of your comfort zone, you'll find out some talents and abilities you have that you didn't know you had. I started speaking just to elementary school kids because I knew they didn't know what I was talking about. And they gave me all kind of stand ovations. We like you, yeah, yeah. Then I graduated up to junior high school and then to senior high school and then to various community groups and church groups and civic associations and then to colleges and to businesses. Now I'm traveling across the country and then traveling nationally and internationally. I do not know nobody can talk me into it even. Yourself, you're telling yourself, no, I'm too tired. I'm achy, there's no way I can make it. You gotta go, you know you have to stick to what you said you were gonna do. You're gonna get knocked down over and over and over and even when you feel like no, I can't be hit this hard or if you're down enough thinking it's No way I can get up from this That's when you're just starting, keep going and then after that you keep Going Be addicted to bettering yourself When you think about some of the great athletes and in so many sports And I, 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 I think the perfect examples, I think For me, it's because I love basketball You think about a lot of these kids um, They go from high school to the pros And obviously that's not the case now You only have, you have to go one year But just think about the kids that went go from high school to the pro. You think about 
your Kevin Garnett, you think about your Kobe Bryant, uh, your LeBron James, um, Michael Jordan, he's one of the greatest. Uh, he didn't go from high school to the pros, but he's considered, you know, obviously the greatest of, of all time. But when you think about what Michael Jordan did as setting the blueprint, especially for a guy like Kobe, he, who was a, at that point when he was alive, he was a living carbon copy of one of the greatest basketball players of all time. It's about what we do. It's about how we handle the situation. It's not, it's not about what happens to us because things are going to happen. How are you going to separate yourself from everybody else? And I always thought any time it got really incredibly hard, I would think about all the people quitting right now and how they're going to feel in a few years that they're just going to say, man, what if I hadn't have given up? What if I would have kept going? Don't say what if, please, 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 please. Don't have the what ifs down the road. But I never would have discovered what I'm able to do right now if I wasn't willing to take a chance. You've got to be willing to do that. You've got to believe in yourself. A lot of people love me to tell this story. When I got out of school, you know, my first major goal was to buy my mother a home. And my hero in broadcasting was Paul Harvey. And I wanted to become involved in broadcasting. And I love the disc jockeys that were on the air. And I wanted to become a disc jockey. See, so I started working to develop my communication skills and expand my vocabulary. I started visualizing myself being a disc jockey. I saw myself on the air having a talk show and playing records and people listening to me. That was my vision. That was my dream. I held that in mind constantly. And I would practice all the time. Practice makes what? Absolutely not. This, this just dislodge that from your mind. Practice only makes improvement. Perfection doesn't exist. You need to take it out of the dictionary. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. Practice only makes improvement. You can always better your best. You have not done your best work yet. Uh, you think about what LeBron has done. Uh, he lived up to the expectation, lived up to the potential in which a lot of scouts and owners and GMs um, pegged him as. And so uh, that's why you look at Steph Curry. That's why you see these guys, they enhance upon their abilities and their, their potential. When you look at scouts and how they grade or evaluate talent, sometimes these scouts are way off base. Look at the, If you go back and look at some of the scouting reports of a guy like Steph Curry, uh, who's a small frame, Another guy, Kevin Durant, they said these guys were, were not going to make it in the league. It was going to be tough. But these are some of the guys that are, I mean, they're lighting it up every night, um, making it to beyond the expectations of, you know, the playoffs, getting to the finals. Look at what Kevin Durant has done, even after the Achilles injury. Not to mention, you know, one of the greatest, uh, you know, basketball players, uh, you know, in LeBron James. Look at what uh, Michael Jordan did. You keep going now and I'm telling you, you'll be in a better place than you would be if you quit. If you want to be great, a man prepared to get up off that mat, the aspirations, the dreams of what it takes, the commitment to hard work, but more importantly, how many lumps you've got to take. That's when your survival skills have to kick in and hopefully you've trained enough in, in your mental preparation and really believe enough in yourself to get up because you know everybody 